You're listening to The Diplomats Podcast on Asian geopolitics. As always, I'm your host, Ankit Panda from New York City. And this is Prashant Parmaswaran from Washington, D.C. How are you doing today, Prashant? Good. How are you doing? Doing well. Um, back from a little bit of travel, so apologies to our listeners for the, the delay again in the podcast. There's been a lot of uh, traveling here and there. I was recently in uh, South Korea and then briefly in Switzerland, um, and actually next week I'll be off to Russia, so there's um, a lot going on these days, but um, there's a lot going on in the world too, and especially because it's November, uh, which for anybody following Asia means that it's the usual round of summitry, uh, usually based around the ASEAN chair, which this year happens to be Singapore. So um, a range of regional leaders and extra regional leaders, including U.S. Vice President Mike Pence, um, all traveled to Singapore for the usual round of summits uh, based around the uh, ASEAN Leaders Summit meeting there. Um, So Prashant, we have a lot to talk about. We have the ASEAN Summit. We have the East Asia Summit. We have some of the activities on the sidelines uh, to potentially talk about, including the third meeting of the reconstituted Quad, um, the the group of uh, the group comprising the like-minded democracies: the United States, Japan, Australia, and India. Which is uh, those meetings are still taking place at a fairly low level at the senior officials level. Um, and then, of course, there's the uh, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation meeting in Papua New Guinea, uh, which is. A pretty important moment for that country to uh, come out as a major node on the uh, Asian stage. Uh, and uh, there's been a lot of attention focused on Chinese President Xi Jinping's trip to Papua New Guinea and China. And Port Moresby have had a very close um, round of cooperation in recent years. So this is seen as a moment for Xi to emphasize China's influence um, in, in the Pacific um, more broadly. But I think APEC was something we'll come back to uh, because as we record this podcast, the meetings there are still ongoing. But I wanted to begin really with um, a look back at the year that it's been for ASEAN. The November summit marks the moment for ASEAN when the rotating chairmanship changes hands. So last year around this time, uh, the Philippines passed over the reins to Singapore and Singapore has been leading ASEAN for the past year as chair. Uh, so I wanted to ask you, Prashant, what were the big themes driving ASEAN this year? And, w- and what are really your big takeaways from the period um, of uh, Singapore's chairmanship of the group? I think the the big takeaway is, um, and, and we'll get to this in some of the other uh, meetings and sideline engagements we talk about later, but um, the idea that ASEAN and Southeast Asia is under stress from several levels. It's under stress because of rising major power competition between the United States and China, whether you look at the trade war or some of the geopolitical tensions, it's under stress because several of the individual countries in Southeast Asia, we've seen this climate of populism and the emergence of leaders like Duterte. Um, And it's under stress because ASEAN is an institution. There's been this enduring theme that we've come back to, including on this podcast, about how ASEAN has become more relevant in terms of the range of challenges that he's dealing with. But as it faces these challenges, can ASEAN and these ASEAN institutions really handle Uh, these range of challenges. So I'd say that's kind of the major takeaway. And the Singapore chairmanship, it's interesting because the Singaporeans and and Singapore in in general has been a very uh, seen as a big regional leader. It's able to manage uh, several of these challenges. And usually it's seen as a a big stalwart uh, within ASEAN. But even Singapore has faced a lot of these challenges itself. I mean, they've had um, issues of the succession of the current prime minister um, that would be the first succession of, of a leader from a, a post uh, Lee Kuan Yew, Lee Sien Long era. That's something that's been weighing down on them. They've had issues with um, cybersecurity. They've been come under pressure from, from China as well. So there, there's just a whole range of issues that Singapore is dealing with as an ASEAN chair. So even as you see some of these big priorities being advanced, like smart cities, cyber, the ASEAN process kind of goes along you have noticed some of these changes and pressures. And I think the Singapore Prime Minister, Lee Sen Long, in his address um, at the ASEAN meetings, talked about this in terms of, you know, he really worries for uh, the future of ASEAN and, and Southeast Asia in terms of how it deals with these multiple challenges. And Thailand's chairmanship, as you talked about um, in the introduction, is going to be a real test of that, more so than Singapore's chairmanship, because the Thais are dealing with their own domestic political transition amidst all of these other challenges. So I'd say kind of that's the broad framing of where we are on ASEAN Southeast Asia. Yeah, and there have been concerns about ASEAN centrality, which I think we talked mm-hmm. about earlier this year um, in the context of 
some of the speeches we heard at the Shangri-La Dialogue when uh, extra-regional leaders, including um, Prime Minister Modi and uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, uh, sort of emphasized that, you know, talk of a free and open Indo-Pacific isn't an attempt to really sideline ASEAN, but really an attempt to build a, you know, an architecture around the existing institutions that ASEAN has really underpinned. So I think the ASEAN states um, recognize that, you know, there are there are these um, new challenges sort of coming about. Um, but, you know, when when you look forward to the ties taking over the reins, um, are you concerned about potentially, you know, the relationship between ASEAN and China? Uh, you know, we're going to see a continued process towards a code of conduct um, under under the Thai chairmanship era, and we're going to see continued interactions between ASEAN and China, including um, further military exchanges and the like. So what's your uh, expectation there for the uh, ASEAN-China relationship? I think the worry for ASEAN-China relations is, is the fact that uh, you really have seen the Chinese try to engage in this um, intensification of their two-track strategy on, on the South China Sea, where they've essentially said, okay, we're going to pursue things such as a code of conduct um, in terms of incremental gains, but those any gains on the diplomatic side will be outweighed by the military and security gains that they're making in the South China Sea on their own unilateral terms. And we talked about the militarization of outposts and such. Um, and then there's the sort of other usual track where they're trying to consolidate relationships with various uh, of their uh, partners in, in Southeast Asian countries. And Thailand's actually a really interesting example of that because it's a traditionally seen as a U.S. treaty ally. It still is in terms of status, but the ties have moved in the last few years appreciably more uh, and closer towards China in terms of their alignment. And so I, I think the worry is that, you know, while Singapore may have in, in its last two years, you know, as the ASEAN China coordinator, as well as uh, the ASEAN chairman this year, they've managed to kind of steady the ship, despite the fact that the, there's been rising Chinese assertiveness and then also concerns about the United States. You know, how will the Thais be able uh, to do that next year? Because essentially, after the Thais, you move towards the Vietnamese, which I guess people will be less concerned about, considering that the Vietnamese have these concerns about China. But for the Thais, they're dealing with all of this, plus, as I said, uh, this, this sort of domestic politics variable, which is they, they're supposed to have their multiple postponed uh, election schedule is supposed to be uh, finalized by early next year. Um, so they're dealing with uh, multiple fronts. And I think the concern is, are they able to cope with this? And the U.S.-China trade war that we've seen really has intensified these concerns and worries in Southeast Asia, as well as you know other parts of the region as well. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Well, so let's talk a bit about the United States. Um, I think one of the most anticipated bits of the summitry this year was um, Mike Pence's attendance of the uh, East Asia Summit. Um, the U.S. made it quite clear up front this year that Trump would not be attending uh, the summit. And last year, he went to Asia for a, um, a multiple country tour, and he actually left the East Asia Summit before the plenary session. Um, and in the past, you know, this was kind of a major point of discussion. Uh, in 2013, Obama couldn't go because of the government shutdown in the United States, and that was sort of seen by many regional observers as a as a signal of potential U.S. disinterest in the region. So this year, Trump didn't go. Um, but, you know, some people have been saying that that's potentially a good thing, given the fact that Pence is in some ways a more reliable and consistent messenger on behalf of the United States government. But on the other hand, really, when it comes to this administration, um, what other members of the administration might say is one thing, but then what Trump ends up doing at the end of the day can be entirely different. So Pence, who um, in early October delivered that uh, speech at the Hudson Institute that we discussed about on this podcast, uh, outlining uh, a long list of grievances about China, uh, really took that message with him to the East Asia Summit, uh, where he delivered a range of remarks um, on Chinese behavior in the region, including uh, the South China Sea. He condemned China's militarization and territorial expansion there, calling it illegal and dangerous, saying that it threatened the sovereignty of nations in the in the world. Um, he also uh, had an interesting interaction on the sidelines of the uh, ASEAN summit with uh, Aung San Suu Kyi, um, and he you know, used some pretty strong language to criticize her and um, effectively said that you know he was concerned about the the fate of the Rohingya, but he did talk about that in the context of the potential um, uh, a radicalization of potential uh, Rohingya refugees, and he expressed his thanks to Bangladesh in his speech at the plenary session. Um, so, you know, I mean, looking at Pence's performance at, uh, at the East Asia Summit, I have to say, I mean, there wasn't much that was really surprising given what we'd 
seen out of the administration in the lead up. Um, but what's your sense about how the region kind of took this speech that Pence had to offer at the East Asia Summit? And more broadly, you know, going back to that question of the fact that Trump didn't go this year, do you think that really ended up mattering at the end of the day, Prashant? I think the way you framed it is, is, is exactly right, which is there's always going to be a part of this just because of the unique personality of Trump that um, just because he is such an outsized personality and there's so much focus on him, irrespective of who comes to the region in, in his place, there's always going to be a sense that any leader can kind of get into the room with Trump and strike a different deal or, or U.S. policy could diverge. I think that it's very difficult to correct in terms of perceptions. I, th I think given those constraints and circumstances, uh, Pence did a, a relatively okay job. I think the key thing for me was that um, the, in terms of U.S. messaging, there really was a attempt for the U.S. to kind of cast itself as a more reasonable party, sort of em emphasizing, you know, we're unlike the Chinese, we're, we're out for collaboration, not control. Um, there was a sense that the United States was trying to signal that in spite of these trade tensions, um, it, it wasn't like the United States was you know, overly hawkish on China. There is a sort of calibration. Mm -hmm. And then the other aspect of that that we saw that, that you hinted at also partly in the introduction is we did see uh, Pence um, and, and the administration in general try to focus more on economic uh, priorities as well to balance out this idea that you know, the United States is, A, focused too much on uh, security priorities, and this is a geopolitical competition, but also, B, there's always been this concern since the Trump administration withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership of, you know, what is the United States really bringing to the game? Um, and, and you've seen that articulated with uh, Pompeo when he went to the region, and I think there was a sense from Pence that he had to say something. So you saw a little bit of conversation on, like, you know, the U.S. ASEAN smart cities network. Um, these are not things that are going to uh, matter significantly in terms of answering the question of, you know, what the United States is going to offer the region. They're not headline making materials. But I do think the administration is trying to kind of toe that line and, and try to manage some of the challenges that we've seen. That's right. Yeah, I think I think that's entirely correct. And, you know, I mean, it's a shame that we're recording this right before um, the conclusion of APEC because Pence mm -hmm. is slated to deliver a major address on the sidelines of APEC that's going to uh, outline a, um, a much clearer vision for how the United States plans to compete economically with China in the region. Uh, we kind of saw glimpses of that last year when uh, Trump delivered a major address uh, around the theme of a free and open Indo-Pacific in um, Da Nang, Vietnam. Um, but this year we're supposed to get some more detail. So I think Pence's performance at the East Asia Summit was maybe more a direct sort of um, outflow from his speech uh, at the Hudson Institute, at least when it came to China. Um, and, you know, he talked about other issues in the region, including things like the Korean Peninsula, where there really weren't too many surprises. Um, but I'll be looking forward to uh, his address um, in Papua New Guinea. Uh, I think that's going to be the more um, the more significant speech to come out of his trip. Um you want to talk a bit about the quad? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the big thing on the quad is, um, well, first of all, as you correctly noted uh, in the introduction, um, this is something that's still, I do sense that the conversation about the quad is um, significantly greater than the actual momentum <laughs> in the mechanism. Yeah. So um, it, it's kind of still at a low level. Um, as you pointed out, there's only been uh, a few meetings, but I think the, the sense I wanted to talk about uh, here, because we, we, we have a lot of other topics to get to as well, is there is this notion by several of these quad countries that they do want to, uh, I guess, correct the notion that this is purely a geopolitical or security institution. There is a sense that they want to focus on this issue of infrastructure and connectivity to try to make sure that this is something that's more balanced uh, in orientation. They're trying to get that message out, but I didn't sense that uh, the commentary that came out following the Quad actually captured that. I, I sort of saw the same similar conversation about you know, the Quad versus China, the Quad versus you know, some of these other mechanisms in the region like ASEAN centrality. Yeah. I mean, but what was, your, what was your sense of the, the, what was actually done uh, and then the commentary following it? I mean, did you see congruence or? No, I mean, I think I think you're right uh, that what the Quad is in reality and what it has done over the course of its three meetings since last November when they first reconvened at the senior officials level has really been a total disconnect. I think the Quad is kind of, the, you know, being seen as this exciting new institutional arrangement when it's not really an institutional arrangement. It's more sort of a consultative forum between these 
four countries, three of whom are allies between them. And then you have sort of India that's an outlier, but has a close strategic partnership with all of the other participants. And I think this year, um, this latest meeting of the Quad, you actually saw probably a bigger divergence between India and the other three members mm-hmm. that you had uh, at the previous sessions, which I thought was interesting. Um, and I think it's particularly interesting given that we've sort of seen a rebalancing in the India-China relationship um, that New Delhi is sort of milking at the moment, um, not really too keen. You know, last year, for example, the Quad was taking place shortly after the resolution of the Doklam crisis. So the geopolitical context there was quite different. So for instance, this year, um, uh, so um, a Devi Rupa Mitra, uh, a reporter at the uh, Indian site, The Wire, put together a very useful comparison of the four uh, statements released after the latest officials meeting. And it's really different. Um, it's really notable to look at the uh, Indian statement. And, you know, there's no mention of the South China Sea. Um, and it's really kind of restrained in in what's included here specifically. Uh, you know, so I don't think that really signals that the Indians are losing interest in the quad, but just that right now the quad is sort of on autopilot. And really it's about the the trilateral and the bilateral mechanisms contained within the quad that I think are the locus of the more significant action. For instance, I think, you know, um, looking at India specifically, you might want to take a closer look at things like the more um, the recent summit between Prime Minister Shinzo Abe and uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, which had some pretty significant um, advancements on the uh, military to military relationship there. Um, Mm -hmm. But, you know, looking at the commentary surrounding the Quad, I mean, yeah, I think that there is this idea that the Quad is a greater thing than it is. There have been a few useful correctives kind of pointing out the fact that the Quad is really a mechanism to sort of network these countries um, and also pursue relationships with with third countries like Vietnam um, was, I think, an important um, focus of the discussions this time around. Uh, mm-hmm. it, it's also interesting that, you know, uh, speaking of ASEAN centrality, uh, that was, again, emphasized in the statements this year, that they really wanted to emphasize that the Quad was not an attempt for these larger countries to kind of usurp um, the the role that ASEAN has historically played in the region, but sort of complement it uh, and create a network of sort of like-minded countries. Um, but yeah. broadly speaking, I mean, you know, if they... Um, I don't see an imminent upgrading of the quad level dialogue just yet. I think it's probably going to stay at the senior officials level um, for a while. But I mean, it looks to be, you know, the kind of the predictions last year that were more tempered appear to have come true and sort of the the more breathless predictions that the quad is going to emerge as a, a significant new institution hasn't really um, played out just yet. Yeah. And I guess the the other uh, thing that's happened with this round of symmetry too is I, I do sense that you know there there is a I guess a, a a perception that even as these these summits are going on and people are paying attention uh, they're also looking ahead to uh, the the Trump Xi meeting uh, yeah around the G20 and whether you know there's going to be some kind of U S China deal or or maybe an easing of of tensions or whether this uh, moment in U.S.-China relations, uh, where we've seen really a kind of hardening of rhetoric, but also some significant measures so far, um, I think folks are looking to see how that plays out, uh, even as these summits are going on. So that that does present, I think, a little bit of uncertainty in terms of the commentary. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting on that front. You know, just to just briefly address the U.S.-China issue. Um, In the lead up to this highly anticipated G20 meeting, it really seems like there's a hardening now in the U.S. position. I mean, Mm -hmm. so the fact that Pence carried himself in the way that he did at the East Asia Summit and probably the what he's going to say at APEC, I think, are going to lead um, to a higher state of tensions going into the Trump-Xi meeting than might have otherwise been expected a few weeks ago when this meeting was kind of seen as an attempt by both sides to sort of walk down tensions. And also sort of entirely separately from the East Asia Summit and APEC, you know, we've seen signs um, right now um, just over the past day from U.S. Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross that the U.S. is still planning to go ahead with an increase on tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese imports, um, increasing that from 10% to 25% starting in uh, January 2019. And also um, the U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer um, sort of rebuffed reports that, uh, you know, tariffs were on hold as the United States and China tried to work things out. So really, if you look at what what Pence said at the East Asia Summit and what Lighthizer and, and Wilbur Ross have been saying, it really seems like going into this G20 meeting that there's probably less of a chance of the two sides sort of walking things back. I fully expect, you know, Trump's going to talk about how Xi Jinping's his new best friend again um, <laughs> after getting in a room with him, because that's kind of what he does whenever he meets someone. He yeah. immediately develops a, a personal rapport with them. Um, but apart from that, I think the broader U.S.-China competitive dynamic is is probably here to stay for now. 
Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, um, like I said, I mean, maybe when we come back uh, with the next episode of the podcast early next week, we'll be, uh, you know, we'll have heard the apex speech from Pence um, and sort of get a broader sense of where this all might be heading. So maybe, uh, you know, we can reflect on that uh, then. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Right. Well, I think we'll we'll stem it there. Um, so uh, just for our listeners, next week is Thanksgiving in the United States, but, but Prashant and I will try to uh, get an episode in before the uh, holiday in the later part of the week. And after that, um, again, I will be traveling a little bit, but uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, keep the podcast on schedule. So thanks a lot for listening. Um, and if you like what you heard to, uh, heard on the podcast, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. And if you've been a subscriber for a while, but you haven't left us a review yet on iTunes or Google Play, please do that. It really helps get the word out about the show. And finally, um, make sure you subscribe to our new newsletter on political risks in the Asia-Pacific region. You can subscribe to that at diplomat.substack.com. Um, and it's still a relatively new product, so if you have any feedback on how you find that, um, please do reach out to me directly. I'd be very happy to receive that from you. So thanks a lot for listening, and we'll be back next week with more.